North Carolina has now dropped two of their last three games. A disturbing trend or just a blip on the radar? You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Thursday, February 8th, 2024. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade. We are joined today by our guy, Coach Bill Robinson, the head coach of the Milligan University Buffaloes, coming off a 19-point victory earlier in the week, and the Buffs are on a three-game winning streak. Way to go, Coach. Keep it rolling. We want to thank you for joining us on Locked on Tar Heels, in particular, you everydayers, to get your Carolina content every single day. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers, join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Folks, if you'd like to be an even bigger part of this community, you can come join the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community where we're hanging out talking all the time. Come for the Tar Heels, stay for the cord. It's great stuff and we'd love to have you there. Coming up on the show today, we're going to look back at Tuesday night's game. I know we're two days removed now on Thursday, but uh, we want to look back and kind of take stock of some things. So uh, Carolina struggling a little bit with the Clemson zone. What exactly were the Tar Heels missing with Seth Trimble out? Um, But we also do want to talk about a few positive things, just seeing more of the chemistry of this team back from the weekend. But um, coach, I just want to start big picture with this thing. Because you've got this massive Duke win on Saturday, but that's sandwiched in between back-to-back Tuesday losses at Georgia Tech and then at home to Clemson on Tuesday night. From your seat, both as a coach and a fan of this program, is this a disturbing trend that we need to be concerned about? Or just a, a little blip on the radar, some some looking ahead to Duke, some recovering from Duke, and and you get things put together. What's your thought? I'm a little concerned right now, and I think I'm more concerned because of the fact that uh, the game plan to how to beat Carolina has seemed to be established. Be physical, put somebody big, long on RJ, make it really hard for him to catch the basketball, don't give him any good looks. Uh, Put Armando in ball screen defense and then attack him, or if there's a switch or whatever. And it seems like these are X and O things that we need to be able to get figured out. But I think more concerning to me was the lack of consistent effort. And, and that's mm-hmm. kind of what Hubert talked about in his post-game right. uh, interview. Was, hey, this is not an X and O thing. And he finally did call timeout. I know people talk about how oh, he needs to call more timeouts. <laughs> and that's they, get, they get four. I get six. So I can call an early one. I can call an early two. Um, I went to the second half last night with five t- timeouts for a half, you know, more than they get for an entire game. So. Right. Uh, but he finally didn't need to get. But again, it's not X and O stuff. It's are you going to F the effort part of it? Uh, when they made their run and they won that long win streak, it was all about the defensive intensity. The defense is what really got them. And then when you get stops, you can get out and run. The transition game opens up, and they're so talented in transition that allows them to really open up their offense. And that's when our, they can't find RJ in transition. You know, now you got somebody running to the rim, and and now they've got to choose between giving up a dunk or a wide open three from RJ. So. You got to get the stops, and that's where it all starts. And I think that's where Hubert was talking about last night. Hey, if we don't get defensive intensity, we don't get the stops. It doesn't really matter what we do at the offensive end because we're going to have to uh, face a set defense every time, and that's hard against uh, you know ACC talented uh, teams. Yeah, I mean, and, and you talk about that talent, coach. I mean, clearly this team is really strong. They had just reeled off ten straight uh, before the Georgia Tech loss, but from from where I sit and from what I've seen. This isn't a dominantly talented Carolina team that can just roll out and assume victory, which I I think is actually a compliment to how well they've played. Um, But for me, the the two losses have shown how slim, how small the margin for error is. As you're saying, if the effort is even 10% less than where it needs to be, that's enough to get you clipped. Um, now, that doesn't mean this team can't continue to excel and continue to be high level. Like, I just see this team as more of a 2017 than a 2009, if we can just think about it from a talent standpoint. But 2017 was good enough to get it done and be the last team standing. But clearly, as you're saying, coach, 
there are going to need to be some tweaks made to get there. And that's what happens over the course of a season. You have your plan. It gets messed up by opponents who have seen tape and, and, and come at you. So coach, what is the next step? How do, how does Carolina fix these things that you're talking about, whether effort issues or X and O issues? Yeah, I'm laughing about the 2017 team because um, the greatest quote uh, of, of that whole championship, we, uh, we actually went back to the hotel lobby after they won the championship, waited for the team to come back, got to hang out a little bit, and then Huber comes down. So we go over and start hanging out. And he, he looks at me and goes, this team? This team wins the national championship? This team? <laughs> wasn't, hey, we're so much better than everybody else. We just got to roll out there and do it. And that uh, the 2009 team was just completely dominant. And that we all knew that, man, this is going to be it. 2017 was kind of a surprise. And, and that's kind of what we're talking about. But it, I think it, it there are some changes, X and O's, that need to be made. Um, the defensive, the ball screen coverages, we may have to start investigating a couple different ways to be able to do that, but it really comes down to that effort. And I know, uh, there's some behind the scenes rumors about practice wasn't very good after the Duke game. And, uh, maybe, you know, just wasn't as intense. It wasn't as crisp. The shoot around was maybe wasn't as crisp, but Hubert alluded to that. He didn't like maybe the lead up to that stuff. And, um, you, 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 do you want to coach? There's people that say, Oh, I want to coach. I want to coach. Well, this is, this is what coaching is. You got the, the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows, and you've got to figure out as a coach to be able to get them on some kind of even plane where they're playing at a high level, maybe not a super high level, but that higher level than not letting the big dips. And that's what coaching is all about. And they've got a great staff, and I believe in them. And I think we'll see yeah. the, the changes yeah. they need to make, X's and O's. I also expect them to see a lot more energy and a lot more enthusiasm uh, You know, come next game. That's that's good word. And, and Coach – I think so much is made of like, anytime I'll say something like, man, like that travel really affected people or, um, there, there's a hangover after the Duke loss, you know, all these kind of things. I inevitably there's always pushback of, well, they're young men, they're resilient. They should be fine. But, but coach you, you are with young men this age day in and day out. So can you put into perspective for us, like how much of an emotional physical mental toll a game like the duke game takes out on these young men and how then that affects like this clemson game for example so how much of it is that hangover and how much of it is the team just not being mentally prepared and ready to go on tuesday night i think the hangover leads into the bad practices to the bad shoot arounds because now you've got people in your in your ear and you got you know this big celebration and you've got you go to class on monday hope they go to class on monday um and, and you got students in there and, and they're all talking about the game. And how do you focus on what's really important in life when everybody is, is, is celebrating this huge event? Um, so I think it is, it, you know, they're young men. They're going to get caught up in some, just, just the enjoyment, just, just the, Hey, you know, we, we've arrived, you know, we beat Duke, um, but they forget what they had to do to get there. And I think that's what I'm, you know, and, and there are lessons learned. Can we learn a lesson quickly? Uh, you know, we're looking at, you know, losing two out of three. That's what the focus for me would be in practice today. Yeah, we beat Duke. And let's be honest, as a fan, if we're going to lose two out of three, we're going to win one game in that stretch. The Duke game's one we're going to win, you know, because that gives us bragging rights. But, you know, so we're we're happy we won that game. Uh, we didn't want to go. You know, if we'd gone two and three but lost the Duke game, people would be upset that we lost the Duke game. Yeah. Um, so hopefully this will give us you know, a little bit of a wake-up call. And uh, boy, I would love to be a fly on the wall in practice today. <laughs> That's absolutely right. And you got a chance to get right back at it on Saturday. Now, coach, the the thing I am hearing most, the fan base chirping about and talking about coming off of this loss more than anything else is Cormac Ryan, who unfortunately had an 0 for 6 night from three, was one of 10 from the field, almost identical to Joe Girard's line the last time Carolina and Clemson played. So Coach, my question to you is not specific to this situation, although it is, but I want to look at it more generally. How do you treat a situation like this where a player who is a shooter is really struggling shooting-wise? And what what are the other things that a player, and I guess this is more specific to Cormac Ryan, like Cormac, brings to the table to make it wise to keep him in the starting lineup even when the shot's not falling? Yeah, I had Melvin Scott in my uh, in my gym one year 
uh, a camp and I had a uh, shooting station. I asked him, hey, do you want to you want to teach the shooting station this this uh, this week? And he said, yeah. So he gets the kids together and says, kids, the only thing you need to know about shooting is one thing. Confidence. Confidence. You just need to keep shooting. If you miss it, you need to shoot the next one. If you miss it, you need to shoot. That. And I'm sitting there going as a coach going, no, don't tell them that. Please don't tell them that because they're going to shoot the ball the whole camp. But uh, he's right. I mean, it was about the confidence uh, and his confidence is down right now. So when we have a situation like that, we our best shooter uh, in a game on the road uh, two weeks ago went 0 for 9. Uh, this past Saturday, he was 9 for 14, hit nine threes and had 41 points. <laughs> so in practice, you got you to keep sitting there going, next one. If he misses one, next one. If he misses one, hey, run that again. Let him shoot it again. If he misses it, hey, run it again. Let him and, and just get it to the point where he starts to feel some confidence. Um, we talk about NFL. We, I have a group at lunch. We sit around and talk to the table. We talk about all the, you know, the topics of the day. And we talk a lot about quarterbacks. And all we need to get a new quarterback. Who are you going to get? Uh, I'm a Vikings fan. Kirk Cousins had the Achilles injuries. And people were like, well, we're not sure at 36 he's going to be able to come back and do what he's doing. Who can you get who's better? Okay, so let's take Cormac out of the lineup. Who's going to take that? his minutes? Who's going to provide the shooting? Um, I know people were upset that my, my guy Paxton played 22 minutes last night. But he had seven points, six rebounds, did some really good things. Is he the one who's going to get Cormac's minutes? Cormac does a lot of other things other than shoot. We do need him to make shots. We do need to make some some threes to be able to, to be that next guy to kind of spread the floor a little bit. But who's the next guy to be able to step in and 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 take that role? Right now, I don't think there is anybody. So in my case, as a coach, I'm sitting there going, hey, I'm going to put a ton of confidence in this kid on a daily basis. I'm going to continue. I saw a post today, somebody wanted Kerwin Walton back. And I'm like, I don't think they understand. We, I mean, Hubert couldn't get Kerwin to take shots in practice. He would have a deal and say, hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to challenge you today. Just take six shots in practice today. He couldn't do it. Well, how, how about take 10 shots next time? And he, So, you know, th there has to be some kind of common sense here. Cormac's going to play a lot of minutes. He just needs to get the confidence. They know he can make shots. He's made shots in, in, in games. He's made shots in practice. It's a confidence thing right now. He, they just need to get worked through this, in my opinion. All right. Love it. Thank you, Coach, for that insight. Now, somebody who has been back the last couple games is Armando Baycott. Is he back? Are we seeing the new and improved Armando Baycott? Plus, why did Carolina struggle so much when Clemson switched to a zone on Tuesday night? We'll get on to all of that in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode's brought to you by FanDuel. Happy Super Bowl week to all of you who celebrate out there from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, grabbing your favorite football snacks, and placing some super bets. FanDuel has a bunch of different ways for you to end the season with a W. Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, and right now, by the way, the 49ers are favored by two and a half. Unfortunately, coaches Vikings and my Falcons are nowhere near this Super Bowl. Woof. But FanDuel also has bets for things like which players are going to score a touchdown or how many points will be scored. So much more. So new customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Once again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Armando Baycott, after having, you know, a stretch coach of where he's not been putting up Armando Baycott-like numbers while still doing some other things to help the team, now in back-to-back -back games, home against Duke, home against Clemson, has put up 20-point, 10-rebound performances. So, Coach, is Armando back? I think he is. And I think um, teams, again, some of it's, it's game planning, some of it's X and O stuff. But he just looked more energetic last night. He looked like he was really intense. It, and the last two games, he's been great. And and I, we all go through lulls and lulls in life. And, and and he just kind of maybe just had a little down. And there were games where they just didn't need him. And uh, But when the game is on the line, they did need him. He's, he's really showed up these last two games. So I feel like he just seems more aggressive. He wanted the ball more. He, he's rebounding again. Uh, I expect to see the – the Armando we all love, uh, you know, for the last month of this, you know, regular season and into the tournament. Well, and coach, I mean, one of the things that people had discussed some is like when Armando wasn't doing those things, it's like, is it better for the team if Armando is getting, you know, 
seven, eight, nine, ten points, six, seven, eight rebounds, because that means that Harrison Ingram is doing more, RJ's doing more. And the the sum of that is perhaps better than the individual parts. Do you think Carolina is better when Baycott is putting up these kind of numbers, or is the reverse true for you? I think it's better when we we have balance, and and then you you have an inside outside presence. I still believe in getting the ball inside, and I think he's he's the guy you got to get the ball inside too. So when you're able to play inside out, when you're able to have somebody in there that draws a double team, and a lot of times if if he's scoring five and having seven rebounds, he's he's still making the team better by creating a double team when it comes to him and making the right decision to get it back out. No, no sense to go ahead and try to force through two people. So if he's making the extra pass, and sometimes that leads to a hockey assist where he throws it out, they make one more pass. He's not getting a stat for that play, but he's making the right decision. So Boy, they I should love count. They yeah, should I love the count it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But it, as long as there's balance on the team, I have okay. no problem. Whatsoever. So I, I love to see uh, you know him have big nights, but at the same time, as long as he's making the right decision, that's more what's important to me. And and honestly, that, I guess sometimes that's going to be game flow specific, depending on opponent and what their strengths and weaknesses are and what the Tar Heels are called upon to do. By the way, what a performance from Mondo at the free throw line Tuesday. 10 of 11, hit nine straight, and really carried the team once they were down in that 17 to 4 hole. Coach, one of the things that happened is as North Carolina finally started working their way back into the game, um, Brad Brownell very shrewdly went to a little zone. One of the things um, that I noticed about it is it wasn't just like a straight up two, three Syracuse zone where you can really get into the high post and operate from there. They were tagging the high post player, um, not allowing him to just have open uh, view of the court and be able to do things. You know, I, I had talked about on our live postcast. I was like, I don't know what was happening. Why aren't they getting to the high post? And then I went back and watch, rewatched several of those possessions, coach. And I thought it was a really savvy zone from Clemson. In fact, uh, Harrison Ingram said, quote, we have a lot of zone plays and we weren't really executing well. Their zone was giving us problems. Their coach recognized that he kept going to it and we couldn't score. So my question to you, coach, why not? Scoring is about rhythm and shooting is about rhythm and being able to to be able to run things and just get kind of a flow. And the zone just completely took Tar Heels out of their rhythm at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it was more of a point zone, more of a matchup zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, you still have responsibilities for a man. And uh, you're not it's, it's zone because you're in certain areas. But um, most offenses are designed just like a soccer game where it's creating space and filling space. One guy cuts, somebody fills in behind. and within that zone, you know, even if a guy cuts, you can kind of go with them. And if you don't pass them off to somebody else, you just stay with them. And it, it kind of, the zone kind of evolves all around, you know, where the movement goes. And a lot of times you're sending somebody off, there's somebody else coming back off. So you could almost run your offense, your man offense again at some times too, but it did just get everything bogged down. It got stagnant. Then all of a sudden the shot clock gets low and, and you end up <laughs> taking a, a bad shot and uh, bad shots lead to, good shots at the other end very often. So um, again, I, it's not that the coaching staff wasn't ready for that. I know they're prepared for everything that they see, but it did just kind of change the whole rhythm of the game. Yeah. And sometimes even if Carolina ends up getting a late shot clock, good look, just that slowing down the Tar Heels, that in itself from a tempo standpoint is a win for Clemson. Um, Coach, one of the things I noticed as I went back, it was either the first or second zone. It must have been the first because uh, they were just starting to recognize it. Mondo was not out on the court. The front court at that point was Jalen Washington and Jalen. It was the Jalen show, actually. Um, and Jalen Withers didn't immediately diagnose it. And you see Jalen Washington on the baseline clap his hands and start viciously pointing to the high post like, Wit, Jay Witt, get up there, get to your spot so we can operate this thing. So, I mean, you just see even those kind of things um, just causing those momentary lapses of not yet being able to diagnose it. Then you figure it out. Then you get to the high post. And by the time you know it, as you're alluding to, there's only 10 seconds left on the shot clock. So, um, I, frankly, great coaching decision from Brad Brownell. Carolina was able to get some stuff eventually, but um, it, it hurt Carolina again in the second half. So, uh, just one of those things that, that gets you in the flow of gameplay. Now. Coach, somebody that probably could have helped a lot with their athleticism was Seth Trimble, who missed this game with what we only know at this point as an upper body injury. Um, 
Coach, in a game where Clemson's trying to slow things down a little bit, not let Carolina get out in transition, um, where Joe Girard is going off from deep, what what exactly was Carolina missing with Seth Tremble? And in your opinion, would it have turned the tide with him in the game? It's hard to know if it would affect the game or not. It, you know, we're, it's easy to say it after the fact, but uh, what he would bring is the ability to change that tempo. So if they're really trying to slow things down, they're trying to – and one of the things we do with zone is we identify that one shooter that we're just not going to let get a three. And I think they did something similar to that with RJ. They're just not going to let RJ. They're going to make sure that everything, they're always knowing where that one shooter is, shooter, shooter, shooter. So somebody's got to get into the lane. Seth has that ability to be able to put the ball on the floor, get the ball to the lane. Then it doesn't matter what you're running defensively, man, zone, anything, a combination of. If you get the ball to the paint, it breaks everything down. And I think that's what they were lacking right now, last night is, is to have that one extra just explosive guard who can get into the lane. Nobody comes, you finish. If you can't, you know, if somebody does come, you make the extra pass and you get somebody else a shot. So I think that was the biggest thing for me. And to get somebody, you, you need to get that stop. You need to have somebody at the defensive end and maybe can get you a steal and get you a breakaway a layup or, or an easy bucket. It just didn't seem like we get any easy buckets last night. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Carolina, to their credit, only five turnovers. But the problem was only five or six for Carolina. Excuse me. They adjusted it, but only five turnovers for Clemson. You would have loved to seen a few more. All right, coach. It feels like it's been kind of a heavy show. Lots of like somber, like, oh, the things are not right in the world. So we do, we need to have some levity here at the end of the show. This team still has incredible chemistry. And we've seen some really interesting recent examples of that. I want to talk about two of them in particular that Coach Davis recently pointed out. And we'll do that in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode is brought to you by Game Time. Hey, what would you do with an extra $100 if you were in Vegas for the big game on Sunday? Coach, I don't know about you. I love a good filet. I think I'd go to a nice restaurant, spend it on that. Maybe get a little peppercorn crust on it. Give it a little kick. I'm all in on that. Well, guess what? That doesn't have to just be some what if. It can truly be your reality if you buy a big game ticket for this Sunday from Game Time using code Vegas100. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports and comedy, theater, music, whatever that you want to get to, those events in your area. They've got killer last minute deals, all in ticket prices, views from your seat, and a best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets with all of that. Oh, man. So if you want to get in on this, maybe buy a ticket for this weekend right now, Game Time users get $100 off a big game ticket with code Vegas100. Just download the Game Time app, use code Vegas100 for $100 off a big game ticket. Or if you're not going to the game, use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase to any event at Game Time. Terms apply. So download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. All right, Coach Rob, as I said, we've had like a heavier show talking about uh, just uh, miring and uh, swimming in the mire and the muck from Tuesday night's loss. But I, I just want to end the show talking about a few happy things because this team continues to be insanely connected. And there were a couple things. Um, Coach Davis was on Carolina Insider podcast this this week with um, Jones Angel and Adam Lucas. He kind of checks in with them each Tuesday. And there were a couple things he mentioned that I wanted to hit on at the end of today's show. So he, here's Coach Davis's quote. He said, Harrison Ingram was interviewed after the Duke game, and when he left the floor and went through the tunnel, Zayden High was waiting for him to give him a hug. I just broke down. This is Coach Davis talking. One of the things that has been great with this group is how they celebrate each other's success. For Zayden to wait in the tunnel for one of his teammates to congratulate him on how he played just exemplified what this team has been about all season. Coach, is that normal? No, absolutely not normal. And uh, it, that takes time. And I think it started in the summer because these guys haven't been around each other all that long. But it started with, I think they made a beach trip and, and they've done all these little different things where they just spent time together. It didn't necessarily have to be basketball stuff, but they find what their similar interests are and just being able to hang out together. And it's no different than spending time with your kids. It, you know, you have to really be intentional about it and you have to find out what they are interested in. Mm. and then relationships bonds form 
uh, because of that. And I think Carolina has been very intentional about building team chemistry. And you, know, you can't force that kind of thing. But when you're around each other a lot and you're spending time just having fun doing what you, you like to do, those relationships build. And I think we are now seeing uh, the fruit of that labor uh, in, during the season. Man, and and in this specific example, like it is a true freshman doing that. It wasn't, you know, and, and that's not to say anything negative of the other people. I'm just saying the wherewithal of a freshman to have that much relational capital with your guy where it's like, man, I know the whole team's going to the locker room, but to have to have the ability in that moment to stop yourself in one of the biggest moments of your entire freshman year of college and say, oh, wait, Harrison's out there. I should wait on him because coach, it's one thing to, to talk about this chemistry. Like anybody can say, Oh yeah, we got good team chemistry, whatever. It's a whole other thing to actually live it out like this. And I was insanely impressed by that specific moment. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's great to see that. I think Zayden high has, has bought into the whole Carolina way. I think he loves being in Carolina. I think he loves what that means. And even though his role on the court is not uh, maybe what he thought it was going to be, he understands that his role is, is as a teammate is just as important. And once that is actually received and bought in, man, that's a, it's a powerful thing. You can't buy that. And it's something that has to be developed. And, and I think I've seen a, a bunch of people say, Oh, you know, Zayden doesn't play more. He's going to leave. He's going to leave. I think he's, he's all in. And I think he wants to be a Tar Heel. I think regardless of what his time on the court is, I would love to see him, uh, you know, get more time down the road. And he understands where he is right now. Um, but man, it's, it's unbelievable to see uh, just that camaraderie and and to see the Carolina way be bought in so quickly. And what's funny, coach, I don't even know if you realized you, I mean, I know you said this, but you said you can't buy that kind of thing, which is really funny to say in an NIL world that we live in. Uh, and, and it, you know, it's almost like just a word you slipped in, but man, it was more true than, you know, what you just said. Now, coach, I want to go to another moment that coach Davis talked about in that interview with, with Jones and Adam there. Um, is in the Duke game, one of the, I thought, great calls that Coach Shire made was doubling off of whoever was guarding Elliot Cadeau to double down on Armando Baycott because Elliot is just not proving that he can make a three. He hasn't made a three in the calendar year 2024. Like That's just a, a, a true fact right now. It's not always going to be true, but it is right now. So, you know, for a while, Carolina was not doing much with that. It was just like, uh, Elliot, you're going to shoot? Uh, you're going to just dry it. What's going to happen? Ultimately, we finally started seeing a play where Elliot's like, hey, you know what I could do? I I could go screen RJ's guy, get RJ, our best shooter, a shot. Now, what's funny, coach, is all the all the love, all the accolades for that have gone to the coaching staff, and rightfully so, because you expect that that's a call that the coach has made. However, Coach Davis comes out and says, now, hang on. No, 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 no. Because even Jones and Adam were assuming that. Coach Davis says that was Elliot. Coach, what does it say about the savvy awareness of yet another true freshman to to realize, hey, look, I'm open and I should not be the one taking this shot. It's actually hurting the team. What could I do to get our best player a shot right here? Yeah, I think it shows the high IQ of of Elliot and uh, also shows the experience that he's had at a high level, even though he's a freshman, he's played at a very high level. He understands the game. And he sees the game more of a veteran than a, than a freshman would typically be. I think it also says a lot about Hubert Davis for him to admit that. That's uh, right. Hey, this, this is not, not about me. This is not about my staff. This is something that, you know, the kids came up with. And that shows the trust that they have. And as a coach, you have to, and, and this is a more modern day game than we did when I was playing. Coach, my coach never would ask me what I think. Mm-hmm. He would never ask what you're going to do. And we did it. We didn't ask questions. We never asked why. Uh, we had a situation in our game this week where we were struggling defensively in the second half, and we had tried some zone. We had tried some man. We had tried some switching stuff. And I sat the guys down and says, what do you want to do? What do you believe in? Mm. And they told me what they felt most comfortable. And that's what we did the next possession. And I think that's the, the today's game with today's kids. They want to have input. And they want to become – because if they don't believe in what you're doing – they're not going to do it very well because they're not going to, if they don't believe they're not going to play it hard, the intensity is not going to be there. But if they have some kind of feedback, and I think the same thing, if Elliot has a choice and he says, hey, this is what I think we need to do, and the coaching staff says, no, we're not going to do that, it's going to affect the way he plays. Yeah. If they embrace that and say, yeah, that's a great idea, let's try that. Yeah. Even if it doesn't work, let's try that. Then the kids know, hey, 
coach got my back. He yeah. believes in me. He trusts me. And I'm going to go play for them. I love your point there, too, about Coach Davis being willing to not only allow Elliot to make that call, but then being willing to talk about it. So many like would feel like, oh, that that paints me in a bad light as a leader. To the contrary, I think his willingness to let others lead and have ownership shows more leadership from Coach Davis. I'm reminded of the play that got Pete Nance the uh, game-tying shot in Madison Square Garden against Ohio State last year. It was not Coach Davis who drew up that play. I can't. It was either Coach Fred or Coach Lebo. Forgive me, I can't remember. Yeah, I think it was Coach Lebo. Okay, Coach Lebo. And Coach Davis was like, yeah, that wasn't me. Coach Lebo drew that up. That's not bad leadership. That's incredible leadership to me to be willing to share that because when you hire people, you got to put trust in them and not micromanage them. That's what Hubert Davis is showing the ability to do. So ultimately, great de defensive decision by Duke to dare Elliot Cadeau to shoot, but an even better offensive adjustment by Elliot Cadeau to know how to counterattack. That's part of what gives me hope and trust in this team. Yeah, well, I totally agree. And you got to you got to give those, those kids some some input. And uh, when they believe, great things will happen. Mm. And look, it's still a long season. There are many more great things to happen, folks. We got eight regular season games, plus whatever happens in the postseason. I, for one, cannot wait to see what happens next. And that's going to start Saturday at Miami. We'll get you ready for that on tomorrow's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. But for today, if you haven't already, come join the Locked on Tar Heels Discord channel. Coach and I were just talking about a little bit ago how much fun it is and uh, how, what great interaction we get to have on there. The link is in the show notes. It's free to join. We'd love to have you. If you haven't subscribed to the show, please do that on video and audio. Smash the like button if you're watching so we know you were here. If you wouldn't mind, please leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It helps a ton. It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll talk to you again tomorrow, but until then, peace.